Let us bow our heads and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings that you've given us today. We thank you that we can put aside a short period of time to learn more about you. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that it refreshes us, that it helps build our, our intellect up so that we can choose more wisely as we go through our lives. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Is that a bit too loud? Is that echoing just a touch? Can you just turn down a bit, please, Abel? Testing, testing. Just a, a, a really quick recap on what we covered last month and the month before. It is very quickly, it's one slide, and we're talking about the Holy Spirit or the personality of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not a lesser God. The Holy Spirit is not a simultaneous manifestation of God in spirit form. The Holy Spirit is not an impersonal force. The Holy Spirit is not some kind of inanimate power. The Holy Spirit is not or are not the spiritual gifts. The Holy Spirit is not or are not the words in or of the Bible. And the Holy Spirit is not merely an influence, though we did say the Holy Spirit is able to influence us. And we concluded by stating that the Holy Spirit is a person and the Holy Spirit is a member of the, the Trinity, that he is a part of the unity that is God. He is God who indwells the redeemed and works within us to fulfill the word, the will of God for us and works in the world. And as believers, sometimes we fail to realise that it is our blessing and it's our privilege to have the Holy Spirit living within us. This week we're going to talk about the deity of the Holy Spirit. There are two questions I think that we should be asking ourselves as we think about it. Is how do we know that the Holy Spirit is God? And how do we know that the Holy Spirit is co-equal? with the Father and the Son, yet a distinct person in the Godhead or in the Trinity? And I think there are a number of answers. But the answer is there is the Holy Spirit's association with the Father and the Son within the Scriptures. So if we look at Acts chapter 2, verses 32 and 33, it says this, This Jesus... God raised up and of that we are all witnesses being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the father the promise of the Holy Spirit he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing now that doesn't say about equality but it talks about the three persons in one However, when we get to, say, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, it says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And there we can see equality. So for the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit to be linked together as one God unit or one godly unit in the baptismal command in Matthew chapter 28, leads a lot of credence that that is the case. And I, I do think that it shows that the Holy Spirit is co-eternal and co-existent in the Godhead. And that's just a cursory look. But if we have a look at uh, the teachings of Jesus, for example, Jesus states that the Holy Spirit is one with the Father and himself. He says in 1 John 5 verses 7 and 8, for there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree as one. Now, you may notice that I've used the NKJV there, not the ESV, because that, there is a line in that, that first line, the Father, the Word, or Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, that is disputed. However, if you look at John 14, chapter 20, uh, chapter 14 verse 26 it says this but the helper the holy spirit whom the father will send in my name he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance 
all that I have said to you. When you send someone in my name in those days, you had the full authority, you had the full power of that particular person. And you could look at John 11, 15, John 16, 7 through 13, for example. But then there are other instances. So if you have a look at um, the baptism of Jesus, we see that the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit are present simultaneously. Matthew 3, 16 and 17 says this, and when Jesus was baptised, so there's the Son, immediately he went up from the water and behold, the heavens were opened to him and he saw the Spirit of God. There's the Spirit descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. Remember it wasn't a dove. It was like a dove. That's an image. And coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is the Father speaking. This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. We, we can also see if we look at the, the gifts of the Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 12 it says this, verse 4, now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God. So it's talking about the Spirit empowering. It's talking about Jesus Christ, but it's also saying it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. We can also read about the the association between the members of the Trinity, if we look at 2 Corinthians 13, where it says, you know, the, the, the blessing, the benediction, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. But the Holy Spirit is not lost in God. There is always a distinction between or distinction from the Father and the Son. We do read in the scriptures there, there is absolute unity between the members of the Trinity or the Godhead. But there is a distinction between the Holy Spirit and God the Father and God the Son. And it's not just something that we read in the, in the New Testament. Back in Isaiah 48 it says this, Listen to me, O Jacob, and Israel whom I called. I am he, or I am Jesus. I am the Messiah, I am the first and I am the last. But just a couple of verses later, we read that there is a distinction between the Messiah and the Spirit of God. It says in 48.16, draw near to me, hear this, from the beginning I, which is the first and the last, have not spoken in secret. From the time it came to be, I have been there. And now the Lord God, the Father, has sent me and his Spirit. So we read here, back in Isaiah, that both the Son and the Holy Spirit are sent by the Father. And we see a parallel, or a parallel passage in, sorry, there is a parallel passage to the Matthew one that we read before, which is in Luke 3. And it says this, Now when all the people were baptised, and when Jesus also had been baptised and was praying, the heavens were opened. And the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form, like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. So there are many, many instances where there's this differentiation, but the same association. Even in John, uh, John the Baptist's account, in John 1 it says this, and John, John bore witness. I saw the Spirit, third person of the, of the Godhead, descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him, it stayed with him. And if you think about even Jesus' prayer, talks about the differentiation between, or the distinction between the three of them. John 16 says this, when the spirit of truth, or the embodiment of truth, which is the Holy Spirit, comes, he, personal pronoun, will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He, the Holy Spirit, will glorify me, Jesus. For he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he, the Holy Spirit, will take what is mine and declare it to you. Distinction, equality, all in one short passage. Then again we also read in John 14, 26 again, but the helper, 
the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. There it is, distinction and equality at the same time. Jesus prays to the Father to send the Holy Spirit. We read in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18, it says this, For through him, Jesus, we both have access in one spirit, the Holy Spirit, to the Father. So there is a distinction of jobs in a sense. It is by the Holy Spirit that we have access to the Father, though it is through the acts of what Christ did on the cross that we can have the Holy Spirit do this for us. And then again in John 15 it says, The Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. There's still the distinctiveness of all of the three of them, yet the different roles and responsibilities that they have. It is the Father who sends the Holy Spirit out, though Jesus requested it. We also know that the Holy Spirit is God because the Holy Spirit has God's attributes ascribed to him. So as we read the scriptures, we see that the same fundamental and moral attributes we see given to God the Father and God the Son are also given to God the Holy Spirit. And I would dare say that this could only be and would only be if the Holy Spirit was God. From the very beginning, the Holy Spirit was called God. Remember Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and the darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering. The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And then jump to Acts. I think this is very, very plain. But Peter said to Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? That means to lie to God and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land or the proceeds of the land. While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? I don't know about you, but this line's pretty plain. You have not lied to man, but to God. And then again in 1 Corinthians 3, you can read it, and 1 Corinthians 12, similar passages. So the Holy Spirit is called God from the beginning, and the Holy Spirit is eternal. Hebrews 9 says that, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit, offered himself without blemish to God? We read that uh, the Holy Spirit is omnipotent. Luke chapter 1 verse 35, it says, And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High. If A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. We also read that the Holy Spirit is omniscient. 1 Corinthians 2.10, it says, These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. He knows the complete knowledge of God. Romans 8 says this. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he, tie that with 1 Corinthians 2, and he who searches the hearts knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the, the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. You have to be pretty close to God to know the actual will of God. Omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. We can go back to Psalm 139. It says this. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea... Even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. You cannot escape from the, from the Holy Spirit. He is omnipresent. We say that you know, the word holds everything together and that is true in a sense because God is a unity. We've seen Genesis 1.1 or read Genesis 1.1 but what about Romans 8.2? It says, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free. 
And we also know that the Holy Spirit is God because the Holy Spirit has the moral attributes of God. Again, in John 16, 13, we know that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. Verse 13 says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. And it also says he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come. So the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. We also know that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of love. Romans 15 says, I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the spirit. That means the spirit is the one from which the love, what's the word I'm looking for? flows we also know that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of holiness holiness is set apart like God unique Romans 1 4 and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead and you could take that passage and have a look at a whole little a whole lot of things where the Holy Spirit is working in the life of Jesus Christ you have a look at Ephesians 4.30 as well. We also know that the Holy Spirit is God because of those divine works that are attributed to the Holy Spirit, just as there are works attributed to God the Father and God the Son. We touched on this beforehand, but the Holy Spirit was active in creation. Besides Genesis 1, Verses 1 and 2. How about Job 26? It says this, By his spirit he adorned the heavens. His hand pierced the fleeing serpent. Have a look at Job 33 and Psalm 104 as well. The Holy Spirit was active in the inspiration of the scriptures. You know these verses off by heart because we're Protestants. 2 Peter 1.21 For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. We know 2 Timothy 3.16 Off the heart all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching for reproof, for correction and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete equipped for every good work. Sometimes we forget that the Holy Spirit is active in the regeneration of us, fallen mankind, and in making mankind into a new creation if they call upon the name of Jesus. Remember John 3, it says this, Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to Jesus, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. But also we've got to remember that the Holy Spirit is active in the resurrection of the body. Romans 8 says this, but if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life. Because of righteousness. If the spirit of life, that's God, who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. So as we look at the scriptures, it is fairly plainly revealed that there is one God, but... He exists in three persons. There is the Father, there is the Son, and there is the Holy Spirit. So, let's capitulate. Or, no, no, that's not the right word I want. Let's draw it all together. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity, or the Godhead. The Holy Spirit is co-eternal. He's co-existent. The Holy Spirit is co-equal. With God the Father, he is co-equal with God the Son. And the Holy Spirit is shown to be God throughout the scriptures. And the thing that they used to say in the old days is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are distinguishable, but indivisible. 
And sometimes we think that the work of the Holy Spirit started in the book of Acts. But if you, I'd like to look for a while this evening at the work of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. And he is directly mentioned over 90 times in the Old Testament books. And we can see the Holy Spirit working all the way through. We saw the Holy Spirit working in creation. We saw the Holy Spirit working in God's chosen nature, nation of Israel. And we can actually see the Holy Spirit implementing the plan of salvation all the way through the, Holy, uh, through the, through the Old Testament, even if it is just the fact that he inspired the writers of the scriptures, though it is much more. We read that the Holy Spirit was, or the Spirit of God was active in the creation of the heavens and the earth. And we read Genesis 1 and we read Job 26. But how about Psalm 33, 6? It says, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. And by the breath of the, the Spirit of his mouth, all their host. The Spirit of God gave life and the spirit of life uh, the spirit of god gives life and if we look at other scriptures he continually gives us breath in the sense that he keeps us alive not just to people but to animals and the whole of creation psalm 104 says this when you sent send forth your spirit they are created and you renew the face of the ground. Something that we don't take into account very often. We know that the Spirit of God was active in the creation of mankind when he made us in his own image. Genesis 2.7 says this, Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. One day I'm going to ask the Lord what that word living means. Because I don't think it means exactly what we think it means. We see the work of the spirit in life itself. Even when we fight against him. Acts chapter 7, I love this. You sniff, you stiff-necked people uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. We look at that sometimes and we look at the fact that the Jews were not nice to their prophets. But sometimes we miss the point at the same time. The Holy Spirit was working in all this time, even though the Israelites were bopping off and torturing and not listening to the prophets that they didn't like. The Holy Spirit was still working. Even when we fight against him, the Holy Spirit worked. And there is the continual work of the Holy Spirit in inspiration. Think again, the Holy Spirit moved upon, breathed on, inspired the authors of both the Old and the New Testament. Gave them revelation. Inspired them. And then even before the New Testament, the Holy Spirit revealed and inspired the authors of the Old Testament to foretell the coming and the suffering of Jesus Christ. I could pick an Old Testament passage for this, but I like this, this, this quote from Acts 28, 25, and it says this, And disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers, through, the Isaiah, through Isaiah the prophet. And you can go back and read Isaiah 6 verses 9 and 10. But the Holy Spirit was slagging Israel. What? Slagging. Telling them off. You don't ever listen. 
we, we do, contrary to what we sometimes think, we do see evidence of the work of the Holy Spirit in other nations other than just Israel. You think about this, the little girl who tells Naaman to go and see the prophet. How about Nebuchadnezzar? And then he says something about God that only the Holy Spirit could reveal. How about Balaam? Holy Spirit worked through a donkey, a human donkey and an actual donkey. He worked through Samson. But we do see the distinct works of the Holy Spirit in Israel. And here the Holy Spirit especially equips and inspires and empowers chosen people. So for example, we read of the Spirit of God enabling Joseph to interpret the dreams of Pharaoh in Genesis 41. We read this of the Spirit of God who gave wisdom and the ability for the building of the tabernacle back in Exodus. We hear of the Holy Spirit enabling the 70 elders to prophesy in the camp of Israel in Numbers. And as we read the book of Judges, we see that individual people are especially equipped by the Holy Spirit. So there's Othniel in Judges 3, there's Gideon in Judges 6, there's Jephthah in Judges 11, there's Samson in Judges 14 and 15. There's Joshua who was equipped with the spirit of wisdom after Moses had laid his hand on him. That's from Deuteronomy 34 and Numbers 27. Then there is the the instances where the spirit of the Lord was upon David as a king and as a prophet and as a songwriter or a psalmist in Israel. And we can see those in 1 Samuel 16 and 1 Chronicles 28 and 2 Samuel or 2 Samuel 23. Then there is the instance of King Saul where the Holy Spirit came, across, uh, came upon him and he prophesied. That's 1 Samuel 10. There are other instances where the Holy Spirit came, across, uh, came upon uh, the, uh, the priests in 1 Chronicles 20, 1 Chronicles 24 and Luke 1. Zechariah, remember? Anna? Then there are all the prophets. We read about the Holy Spirit coming across them. There's Balaam again in Numbers 24. Azariah, 2 Chronicles. Elijah, 1 Kings. Elisha, 2 Kings. Amasai, 1 Chronicles. Zechariah, 2 Chronicles. Micah in Micah. Ezekiel in Ezekiel. Daniel in Daniel. Then there's that quote, or Isaiah in Isaiah, and also that quote from Acts. Jeremiah in Jeremiah. And there's Joel, who is quoted in Joel, and also in Acts chapter 2. We see the work of the, old, of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. It is said, and this is what we're going to be discussing tonight, it is said that the Spirit came only upon a select few in the pre-cross, the before Jesus days, in contrast to the Holy Spirit being available for all in these last days. And it's true, we do see that there were men especially chosen whom the Holy Spirit specifically equipped for service. And there is a subtle and a big difference in some senses difference in the experience or the facts of the Holy Spirit for Old Testament believers and New Testament believers. People would like to say that it seems that the work of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament is less permanent in contrast to the way that the Holy Spirit works from New Testament times. 
And I have heard growing up in Bible college and stuff like that that it is said that the Holy Spirit was not available for all flesh in Old Testament times. And one of the verses that we, or set of verses that we hang that on is Joel chapter 2, verses 28-29. It says this, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. So we tend to say that the Holy Spirit was not available in that sense. But I'm not so sure. There is a difference. And I would like to think about it and talk about it and discuss it in a moment. But I think we have to, and this is just sort of priming the conversation. Who was Abraham looking forward to? Jesus. I would suggest that you can't look forward to Jesus without some action of the Holy Spirit I would also hate to think that through from eternity past to the time of Jesus Christ the Holy Spirit had his hands handcuffed together unable to do any work anyway I'm going to pray no I'm not can you show that video in the Old Testament we see different aspects of the work of the Holy Spirit. And you talked about the New Testament where one of the most important works of the Holy Spirit is the work of regeneration by which he, he changes the disposition of our hearts and then dwells within us never to depart. And he's working within us to work out our sanctification and bring us into conformity to Christ. Now in the Old Testament you couldn't be born again in the Old Testament apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit did his work of regeneration then as he does now. The work of the Holy Spirit indwelt people in the Old Covenant just as he does now. The work of the Holy Spirit worked towards the sanctification of the saints in the Old Testament just as he does now. Well then how can we talk about the Spirit departing from Saul? Well there was another aspect or dimension of the Holy Spirit that was very important in the Old Testament, which was the charismatic endowment of power from, on God, from God to enable people to perform a particular task or an office. The prophets were endowed from on high. Moses was endowed from on high. The kings, on many occasions, were endowed by this uh, gift of the Holy Spirit to empower them to carry out their work. And when the case of Saul is concerned, the spirit that departs from him is not the spirit of regeneration, but it's that anointing that God had given to him to fulfill his function as a king. Now that raises the whole question of whether Saul was ever a Christian. I don't think he was. I don't think he was a believer. And it was possible that God would endow or equip people like Samson and the rest with this divine empowerment for their vocation without at the same time saving them. Now, I don't think that happens in the New Testament. I think that's the significance of Pentecost, that we not only receive regeneration and we receive sanctification and we receive indwelling, but we also, from the day of Pentecost onward, receive the anointing of God to carry out our task as believers in this world. In the Old Testament, that anointing was restricted to a handful of people. In the New Testament, it's universal to the whole body. You remember when Moses, when God told Moses to select 70 men that he knew to be elders over Israel, and God took of the spirit that was upon Moses and anointed those 70 to help him. And Joshua objected and said, uh, or, uh, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Moses said, are you envious for my sake? Would that God that all of God's people would be prophets and that he would put his spirit upon them. Now that was just a prayer. 
that Moses had. By the time you get to Joel, that prayer becomes a prophecy where Joel is saying that God would in the future, in redemptive history, pour out his spirit, not just on 70, but on the whole community of believers. And that's what the significance of Pentecost is, uh, where God now fulfills that prophecy of Joel and pours out that mm -hmm. anointing power upon all of us. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can contemplate you. We thank you that your spirit indwells us and it helps us to see clearly. We pray that you'll be with us this evening and that you'll be with us in our conversation and in our thinking. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.